Our next presentation is on endovascular treatment of ruptured aortic aneurysms before, during, and after by Dr. Juan Carlos Jimenez. Uh, JC is Associate Professor of Surgery in our Division of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery here at UCLA. JC? Thanks, Dr. Quinones. Thanks very much, Dr. Quinones. It's an honor and a pleasure to be able to speak at the symposium. Um, my topic today is on endovascular repair of symptomatic and ruptured aneurysms. And this is a disease process whose treatment paradigm has changed dramatically over the past decade. Um, definitely different from when I started training. Uh, and the experience I think that residents and fellows are getting are, is much different now. Um, that, that most of the ruptured aneurysms that we do, at least here at our institution, we start uh, with an endo approach. This is a view that um, many of us uh, used to see quite a bit. We don't see it as often anymore. This is a, an open repair of a ruptured aneurysm, and we all remember how exciting this is. You know, we get into the abdomen, and you know, you're trying to move the bowel out of the way, and you're trying to clamp the aorta before the, the hematoma ruptures, and uh, we all remember how exciting, you know, this could be. However, we also remember how poor the outcomes could be. Um, and so today, you know, we'll talk about a little different approach. Uh, we'll discuss and touch upon key concepts with regard to uh, ruptured aneurysms, epidemiology of the disease, um, how to manage these patients before they get to the hospital, um, evaluation in the emergency department and triage, uh, optimal resuscitation strategies, imaging studies if applicable, uh, intraoperative technical strategies, and management of post-op abdominal compartment syndrome. We all know that ruptured AAA is a very highly lethal disease process. We know. Um, uh, this study out of Harborview in Seattle, one of the uh, top uh, high-volume uh, aneurysm hospitals in the United States, and, and Kai Johansson looked at uh, a nine-year period where they fixed 186 ruptured aneurysms open, and actually their, their, um, their results are actually fairly amazing. I mean, they're able to get 86% of the patients out of the operating room to the ICU. Um, however, 14% of patients sustained intraoperative death. And 32% of these intraoperative deaths were due to inadvertent venous injuries which contribute to the death. And that's, and that's a complication now that with endovascular repair we rarely ever see. Um, overall, the survival was not great in the series, even though most of the patients made it out of the operating room to the ICU, um, there was about a 70% 30-day mortality. Another more recent study of the uh, National Inpatient Sample Database looked at a 10-year period between 2000 and 2010. What they noted uh, was that over the, over the decade, in-hospital mortality rates for both ruptured and non-ruptured aneurysms decreased by more than 50%. So outcomes for, for ac across the board were better. What they did also report was that if you had a, a ruptured uh, endovascular repair, you're 20 times more likely to die than if you had an elective aneurysm repair. And overall, when looking at uh, surgical, open surgical and endovascular repair, you were 15 times more likely to die with an aneurysm rupture as, appeared to, uh, to, uh, as compared to um, elective repair, which makes sense, and we all kind of know that. Um, optimal management of these patients begins before they get to the hospital, and it really relies on um, good communication between pre-hospital personnel, paramedics, and the staff in the emergency department. Um, the vascular surgery team at, at, at the hospital should be notified immediately. Uh, the operating room should be mobilized. Um, you also need to maintain a current standard uh, inventory of, um, of endovascular equipment, sheaths, wires, catheters, balloons, et cetera, and also a variety of, endo, of, of, of um, uh, endograft main body, limbs, cuffs, palma stents, et cetera. You know, you have to have a wide armamentarium uh, of supplies, um, you know, given the variety of situations that you'll encounter. Uh, it's also important to educate pre-hospital personnel with regards to key concepts uh, which help uh, improve outcomes, permissive hypotension, avoidance of uh, undue sedation or intubation before they get to the hospital, and appropriate warming of the patients. So let's talk, you, we'll start with a case that came in not long ago here at this hospital. This is a 75-year-old female with a known history of a 5.1 centimeter infernal aneurysm. She was offered repair uh, electively but refused it. She presented to the emergency room with nausea and vomiting for three days, abdominal pain and distension over the last 24 hours. Um, she was actually rather hemodynamically stable. Her pressure was good, uh, but she obviously had a, a very tender abdomen to palpation, uh, and she had an obvious pulsatile abdominal mass with a uh, presenting hemoglobin of 7.8. So this was, she was stable enough, hemodynamically stable enough to take to the CT scanner. 
we got a CT scan demonstrated a contained rupture uh, with a large adjacent retroperitoneal hematoma. So now this patient's sitting in the emergency department. You're waiting for the operating room to mobilize. You're waiting for the team to come in. Uh, you're waiting for them to tell you, look, you can transfer the patient up to the operating room. What are the key steps now in managing this patient in the ER? And uh, one of the main concepts is um, appropriate fluid administration. Uh, one of the key concepts in dealing with patients who, uh, with, with uh, acute hemorrhage or uh, you know, specifically ruptured aneurysms is the concept of delayed volume resuscitation or permissive hypotension. It's well known that large volumes of fluids in these patients can increase transmural arterial pressure and promote further blood loss. You lose your coagulation factors, uh, the, uh, the, the, the blood gets hemodiluted, uh, you can develop a coagulopathy uh, from this, and th this coagulopathy impairs your retroperitoneal tamponade, which is the one specific thing that's keeping this patient alive at this moment, right? Um, we don't want to aggressively volume resuscitate these patients because it leads to adverse outcomes. You want, we try to keep these patients at about a systolic pressure of about 80 millimeters of mercury until, until you're in a position to be able to obtain proximal aortic control, either uh, with a balloon in the operating room or with a clamp. You also want to ensure that the patient is mentating. If you keep their blood pressure too low, sometimes um, uh, uh, you'll notice that the patient you know, kind of waxes and, and, and wanes uh, mentally. So you want to make sure that if the patient's not mentating, you bring the blood pressure up a little bit you know, until they are. And uh, you want to avoid excessive crystalloids. You also want to make sure that the ratio of blood products that you give uh, are, are, are appropriate in this study uh, out of Stanford by Matt Mell. Uh, found that in patients with ruptured aneurysms, if you administered a ratio of PAC cells to FFP of less than two to one, you had a lower 30-day mortality. So now the patient is in the emergency department. They're transferred to the OR. They're on the table. Uh, and it's very important at this stage to communicate clearly with anesthesia, uh, you know, regarding what your plan is going to be in so, you know, some anesthesiologists are easier to communicate than, you know, with others, especially in situations of high stress and high anxiety. But uh, you want to communicate to the anesthesiologist that you want to avoid undue sedation and induction until you're ready to place an aortic balloon. And basically what, you know, this basically means until, you're, until we as surgeons are able to get a sheath in place, a femoral sheath in place, you don't want the anesthesiologist to induce these patients. What happens is, you have, and it's happened to me a, a couple of times, where you have a hemo, you know, you have a ruptured aneurysm, and everybody, there's no real sense of urgency because the patient looks so stable. And the ER, and, you know, everybody's slow to get to the OR, because, oh, the patient looks stable. And, and then the second they get in the operating room, they crash, and their, you know, systolic blood pressure is 50. So what happens is with sedation and with relaxation, you get a, a, um, an overall loss of sympathetic tone, and then your, your blood pressure can bottom out. Um, we perform femoral puncture under local anesthesia. Um, if the patient's stable, we'll, we will use a pre-closed technique uh, using ultrasound for everybody. We actually find that a percutaneous approach is actually faster than a cut down in most cases. If the patient is, um, if the patient is unstable, we don't perform a pre-close. We just stick the artery and then cut down on the sheath afterwards if we need to. And, and uh, whenever we do these cases, we have two aortic balloons open and ready uh, and two, either 12 French or 14 French, uh, depending on what type of balloon you have. So let's look at the concept of proximal aortic balloon control, a very powerful tool for saving, you know, for saving these patients. Um, this cartoon kind of highlights the technique with which we place these balloons. And this is the reason why you have to have two balloons open and ready to go. So you obtain femoral access and you, you know, put a wire into the aorta you place the first aortic balloon up into the suprarenal location and inflate it. And a lot of times this will stabilize the patient you know, to, a, to a fair degree. And then what we do is we obtain contralateral femoral access. We place the main body and the ipsilateral limb and deploy it while the aortic balloon is in place adjacent to it. Okay? Then once we have the main body and the ipsilateral limb deployed, we put another aortic balloon through the lumen of the graft and up to the neck and we inflate that balloon and deflate the other one that's next to it as we pull that out, right? So that way we kind of maintain uh, aortic control. And then what we can do with this aortic luminal balloon inflated, you obtain contralateral access and you extend the gate and you get a seal. Uh, these are the four main aortic balloons available. They all have their 
advantages and disadvantages. I'm sure the reps will tell you all of them. The, you know, they're happy to outside. Um, uh, it's, it's important to have two of these balloons open during every case. Of note, the Medtronic balloon and the Gore balloon actually have a lower uh, profile. They actually go in through a 12 French sheath, with, with, you know, which may confer an advantage, a uh, lower profile. And this is her final CT scan after we got her endograft in. Good position, no evidence of endo leak. Let's look at abdominal compartment syndrome. This is a fairly common complication after endovascular repair of uh, aneurysms and actually after open repair of aneurysms. I mean, you see this fairly commonly. Uh, and this can occur uh, after putting in an endograft from, from the retroperitoneal uh, hematoma or from ongoing bleeding from the lumbars and the IMA. These patients can get coagulopathic. Uh, and when they go into shock, it leads to visceral and soft tissue edema, which also can contribute to uh, the abdominal compartment syndrome. A series by many meta at uh, Albany Medical Center from 2005 um, demonstrated that patients who um, develop abdominal compartment syndrome after endovascular repair have a fairly, you know, a significantly increased mortality. And the incidence of this uh, problem in their series was about 18%. Uh, diagnosis and management of uh, um, abdominal compartment syndrome, you have to have a low index of suspicion. And even though this is a clinical diagnosis, you don't want to rely on clinical signs alone. You know, you don't want to rely on an abdominal exam. You know, uh, you want to have uh, quantitative and objective data. Um, and what we use is hourly bladder pressures uh, during and after the endovascular repair. And uh, you measure these pressures. If you have a pressure less than 10, it's rarely ever associated with abdominal compartment syndrome. If you have a pressure greater than 25, it's usually always abdominal compartment syndrome. And then between 10 and 25 millimeters of mercury, there's a gray zone. But um, you know, uh, you know, I think it's important to have a very low index of suspicion in these patients because these pa these patients tend to deteriorate fairly rapidly, and then you start seeing um, signs of organ dysfunction. And that, on top of you know a ruptured aneurysm, can be what uh, you know what kills them. So um, treatment for this is decompressive laparotomy with a temporary abdominal closure or Bogota bag. Uh, we tend to avoid opening, messing, or opening the retroperitoneum when, when, when we go in to do this just because you can get into bleeding, uh, you know, that's difficult to control. This is a, uh, an algorithm developed by Manny Meta uh, at Albany Medical Center and colleagues. And it's very similar to our protocol, slightly different, and I'll show you what, it, you know, what the differences are. So upon arrival to the emergency department, you have a, the ER doctor suspects ruptured AAA. Hopefully here, the pre-hospital system has contacted the ER and the Vastra team is on their way in. Um, but once the patient's in the, if the patient walks into the ER, you alert the Vastra team, alert the operating room, mobilize, you're dropping a red line, you have to go to the operating room. Um, in hemodynamically stable patients, you can try to get an emergent CT and this will give you, uh, you know, I mean, this will help you with operative planning. It'll tell you whether there's a neck. It'll tell you whether it's a thoracoabdominal aneurysm versus an infranial aneurysm. It'll give you a lot of valuable information. So if the patient is stable, uh, it's a good idea to try to get it. Obviously, if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, CT is not an option. You go straight to the operating room and you prep for either open or open surgical repair in the supine position on an angio table. Um, this is where our algorithm di differs a little bit. Uh, we obtain percutaneous femoral access, whether the patient is hemodynamically stable or unstable. And as I mentioned before, if the patient's hemodynamically unstable, under ultrasound guidance, we, put, we, we, we get a sheath in the femoral artery, we place an aortic balloon. If the patient is stable, we, do, we use two pre-closed, uh, uh, per-closed devices and, and perform a, a pre-closed closure, get the sutures in place, and then we dilate our sheaths in um, and, and proceed with the repair. If the patient becomes hemodynamically unstable any time, that's when we put a balloon in. Um, we shoot an angiogram. Obviously, if the aortic uh, anatomy is, is not amenable to EVAR, we use the aortic occlusion balloon at the supraceliac aorta as proximal control as we open the abdomen. If the patient's anatomy is amenable to EVAR, we perform an EVAR. So in conclusion, uh, EVAR for ruptured AAA is a very valuable tool that we're using with increasing frequency with good results, good survival in modern series. Uh, successful implementation requires a multidisciplinary approach with good communication between all different specialties uh, to be able to maximize outcomes. Permissive hypotension with avoidance of excess crystalloid fluid improves clinical outcomes. Uh, try to avoid general anesthesia if you can until proximal aortic control is obtained or, after you, or, or until you're in a position to obtain it. 
we use percutaneous femoral access under ultrasound guidance to rapidly place a balloon if need be. Watch out for abdominal compartment syndrome, have a low index of suspicion, and avoid disrupting the retroperitoneal hematoma. Thank you.